All right, fact check this, episode 22, and today I am going to be interviewing Evan Johnson. Evan is one of the uh, Peddling Fiction fans, and he is a excellent follow on Facebook for all of the most recent just total bullshit that goes on with the COVID-19 everything, and Evan gets to uh, bring it to us straight from the heart of all of that horribleness in New York. So, Evan, I'm going to throw it to you and tell us a little bit about yourself, and then let's get after it, because we got a lot to talk about today. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is actually the first time I've ever done a podcast, believe it or not. So a little bit nervous, but mostly excited. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, born and raised in Brooklyn, currently live in Westchester. And, um, yeah, I, I, became pro I became political probably around... 2012 and you know Ron Paul's campaign in 2012 like most people who run in our political circles huge for me before that I was just kind of um you know I occasionally paid attention to like the election once every four years but I wasn't super into politics I didn't really feel like there was a need to be because you know a I was younger and I didn't really care and the the country seemed like it was in pretty good shape didn't have this impending sense of doom, like it was just collapsing all around us like it does now. So there wasn't really like much of a reason for me to get involved. So, you know, I pretended like I knew more than I did, but I didn't really know what the hell was going on. It was really around 2012 that I, uh, I started to lock into politics and, and really start my journey towards where I am now. Awesome. Awesome. That's uh, 2012, was, 2012 was actually when I kind of started to uh, check out a little bit. And then uh, I, uh, I started getting back into it very actively um, in 14 and 15 and then leading up to the election in 16. So well, I get involved in 2016. I think, I think 2016 got everybody involved, whether they wanted to or not. Yeah. Unfortunately it got everyone involved. Some people. Who... Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, here we are, whether you wanted to be political or not, you, you got thrust into it as soon as, uh, as soon as Donald Trump hit the stage. So yeah, you don't have a choice now. <laughs> that's, that's, that's been something that's been infuriating for me. We're going to derail before we even get into the subject that like I had removed myself from politics so much for so long and like, I don't consider myself a Republican. I really genu genuinely hate a lot of the things that re the Republicans do. And everything has become so politicized and so insane that I find myself defending Republicans for not being terrible. Like that, right. that's the that's the political climate we live in, is that for as much as I hate them, I find myself on the side of defending them just because they're not completely shit, you know? It's well, well, yeah. <laughs> You know, one side riots and burns down cities every time something happens that they don't like. The other side doesn't. One side wants to celebrate transgender toddlers and drag queen children. The other side doesn't. One side wants to control your free speech and censor people on the Internet. The other side doesn't. One side wants to cancel you for having the wrong opinion on the Internet. The other side doesn't. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. But it's obvious to me, at least at this moment, which side is worse now, you could go back to like the peak of the Bush years where we were involved in all these stupid wars and he was uh, in the White House and the left was, you know, protesting quite rightly all these wars. I mean, at that time in America, the left was was the better of the two. But things have changed. The power dynamics have changed. And as, of right, as far as I'm concerned, it's not even a question right now. The left is so much worse than the right. It's not even close. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not a Republican. I don't, you know, I don't identify as a Republican. I have a world of issues with the Republican Party, but. Yeah, I'm with you. I kind of find myself going harder at the left these days than I do the right. Well, it's kind of the uh, the left is more or less. Uh, I hate to say it this way, but the the left is a little more on the side of evil, whereas the right is just more on the side of incompetent. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. Look, you know who knows? Twenty years from now, maybe that'll switch. But you know, as of right now, yeah, you're you're correct. All right, so let's uh. Let's hit the big topic because I know I know you've got a lot to say about it, and I've had a lot to say and have said a lot about it. And and don't feel any pressure being on a podcast because I promise you, maybe twelve people will listen to it. So, <laughs> all right, that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, so well, yeah. So I mean, let's let's go back to um, let's go back to mid March, right? Like when all these lockdowns were really starting to get underway. 
And, you know, I have the receipts, uh, you know, on my Facebook page of basically that, that you can sort of see the evolution of how I felt about all this stuff going all the way back to March to where we are now. And in mid-March, I was kind of at this point where I was a little bit more open to the, maybe the necessity of the lockdowns, because that was at the point where they were talking about like a three to 4% mortality rate. And there was all this hysteria. There was guys on CNN saying like 50 to 70 million dead around the world. Best case scenario in America, two to 3 million dead, best case scenario. Um, And so I was like, okay, maybe that's necessary, but uh, I hope people realize what we're doing by shutting down the global economy. This is not inconsequential. This is going to ruin people's lives as well. And, you know, maybe these, if these experts are right about the virus, maybe what we're doing is probably going to be a lot worse than what the virus itself is going to do. And then with each passing week, I saw more and more information starting come, to come out. So there were, there were experts like, um, you know, uh, Michael, Michael Levitt, who's a Nobel Prize winning biophysicist, and uh, Sinetra Gupta, who's the, the top epidemiologist at Oxford, and John Ioannidis, who's an a epidemiologist at Stanford. These people were starting to say around mid-April, um, what we're doing with these lockdowns is completely insane. Okay, first, aside from the fact that it's going to cause immense economic damage and health damage, and it's going to basically kill people all around the world, it's also a terrible strategy for fighting the virus. And so I was listening to them and I was watching as the mainstream media was just completely ignoring these people and big tech was censoring them. And what I couldn't really understand is why we're taking our marching orders from the World Health Organization, which is clearly a corrupt institution. They clearly lied on behalf of the communist Chinese government. And then you have Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook who have nothing to do with each other, right? They're all separate companies. They all decided together that they were going to censor these people. And, you know, these, uh, you know, why, why, we're, why we're listening to this corrupt institution when some of the most qualified experts in the world are being completely ignored, I just couldn't wrap my mind around that. And then you started to see some of the stuff coming out about like, uh, you know, in certain cities, like the suicide rates were four or five times higher than the, um, than the, uh, the COVID deaths were. And, you know, it was like with each passing week, it was just more and more info that was coming out like that. And it all came to a head in June when these nationwide protests burst out all over the country. And these fucking public health experts who had been vilifying people for leaving their house, for going to the beach, for going to church, for taking their kids to the park, for running their business. And, you know, the mainstream media and the public health experts went all in on these people, acting like they were the worst human beings that ever lived. They all celebrated and encouraged these nationwide protests and riots consisting of millions of people all across the country. And as soon as I saw that, I knew beyond any doubt whatsoever, these people are full of shit. They don't care about us. This is not about a virus. Not, and I want to preface this, I've never been one of those people who said the virus was fake. It's obviously real. Uh, it's obviously very dangerous to a certain segment of the population. It can be deadly. I was never one of these people who said otherwise. Okay, my position was always, will the lockdowns cause more harm than they prevent? And, you know, the evidence was coming out that it wasn't. And, you know, it would have been one thing if these public health experts said something like, uh, look, we support your right as Americans to protest. We know this is an important issue. And if you want to go out and protest, we support your right to do that. But given the pandemic, we highly, we highly advise against it. We just think it's a bad idea. But they didn't say that. They Not said you Not need to go out there and protest because the real pandemic is racism. So go out there and all these politicians join them. Uh, you know, all these celebrities, you know, you had a situation where people weren't just protesting, they were rioting and literally burning down their cities. And when you have a situation where you can get arrested for running your business, but you won't get arrested for burning one down, maybe people should start asking some fucking questions. Yeah, at that point, all credibility was completely lost. Like the, the entire mainstream media, the entire medical community, everything. All of them had completely thrown all of their credibility out the window at that very instant. Like it was, and yeah, I was like you, like at, at, at the onset of all of it, I was not entirely opposed to the 15 days or the two weeks to slow the spread. It, it seemed like it may have some uh, valid usefulness, but as we came closer to that, you know, two week, 15 day time frame, 
And then they're talking about pushing it out for another 30 days, another 90 days. And like every time we came to the end of that next, you know, deadline to slow the spread, they just pushed it out further as it, it became very apparent very, very quickly that they did not have any interest in actually observing a deadline on this. Like they were just going to continue to use it to keep us enslaved however they could for as long as they could get away with doing it. And, and what really just infuriates me and is completely insane about the whole thing is how willing people were to go along with it. Like, like, like I said, I was willing to go along with it at the onset, but the more they, the more they continue to push it out, the more I realize this is bullshit. Like th this isn't gonna, this isn't accomplishing anything good. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they kept moving the goalpost, didn't they? Right. Like it was two weeks to, to flatten the curve. And then it was, well, we got to get uh, hospitalizations under, under this number. And as well, we need hospitalizations under this number for this many days in a row as well. We need infection rates under this number. Well, we need infection rates under this number for this many days in a row. And it was like, you know what? Maybe we should just wait until there's a vaccine. And now there's a vaccine. They're like, well, you know what? You're actually going to need two shots of the vaccine. And now even once you get the vaccine, they're saying you still got to wear a mask. You still, so, you still got a social distance. I saw a headline from CNN like a month ago where I swear you can, you can Google this. It'll come right up. Um, it was something along the lines of just accept it. We're never going back to normal. The sooner we, the sooner we all accept that, the better. So now, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if they say, you know what, we got to continue this to 2025. And, you know, I don't, Bill Gates, who is, you know, I, I haven't really looked into Bill Gates much as far as, you know, like, you know, his involvement in the vaccine. I know there's conspiracy like, theories and everything. That's yeah, I, yeah, I'll be honest. I haven't looked into that much into him that much in that regard. But I, I know this. He's not a medical expert. He doesn't have any medical medical degrees. Why is he allowed to go on CNN and all these news uh publications and, and Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and give his ideas about the virus? But. The leading epidemiologist, Sunitra Gupta, number one epidemiologist at the number one uh, university in the world, Oxford. She is quite literally the most qualified human being on the face of the earth to talk about this subject. So when these people tell me to listen to the science, does she count? Does she count as one of the scientists we should listen to or not? So why, why does Michael Levitt and Sinetra Gupta and John Ioannidis and people like that get censored and ignored, but Bill Gates is allowed to get up on TV and give his medical advice? Someone explain that. Exactly. And, and all of the actual science that's coming out is showing that none of these none of these restrictions that they're putting in place, the masks, the lockdowns, none of this stuff is actually accomplishing anything. Like shutting down bars and restaurants. There's the the infection rate in bars and restaurants is minimal at best, like what, 1.4% or some shit like that. Like it, it's not even it's not even a place that's actually causing any harm. But no. and, and then the rules that they have that you have to wear a mask to come in, but then you take your mask off once you get in. Like it's it's also insanely ridiculous. Like the only thing that they're doing is killing these businesses. Like they're not. There's no. There's no actual sound science or even logic or reason behind any of it. It's just ignorance. No. Well, I mean, I so I think like sixty percent of small businesses that have closed due to COVID are gonna wind up being closed forever. So they're basically done. And, you know, Amazon and Walmart and the big tech companies, they're all making record profits. They've all become richer than ever. This has been the greatest transfer of wealth from the lower and middle class to the super wealthy, probably in all of human history. I mean, I'd have to double check that, but I would imagine. But you know what's funny about the restaurants? So there was, and, and you know, the media is really complicit in a lot of this. So I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, so the Nashville mayor, he had data and proof that restaurants and bars were not vectors of spread in his city. And he intentionally suppressed that information and kept those businesses locked down. Now- I, post, I posted that right after it came out. He should be in jail. Should he be, should be yeah. Jail for, and you would at least think if we actually had a media that did their jobs, someone would cover it. Maybe the New York Times wants to cover that. Maybe the Washington Post, none of them. So no one covered that. But you know what story they did cover? the 30 year old Texan who died after attending the COVID party and his last words on his dying bed were apparently, I thought it was a hoax, which by the way, never even happened. That story never happened. No one was able to confirm if the party took place. No friends, no family members confirmed who this guy was or if he ever even existed, which means it didn't happen. But the entire mainstream media ran with that story, but they ignored uh, the, the mayor of Nashville 
suppressing the data that said bars and restaurants were infected. They ignored governors, including my governor, Andrew Cuomo, sending thousands of COVID infected patients into nursing homes, which essentially murdered thousands of elderly people. No one in the mainstream media talked about that. The health secretary for Pennsylvania, she, uh, the governor of Pennsylvania was one of the governors who sent COVID positive patients into nursing homes. The secretary of health for Pennsylvania, her mother was in one of those nursing homes. And before the governor put that order in, she took her out. Think about another person who should be in jail. And again, complete and total silence from these lying vermin in the mainstream media. Yeah, the, the if nothing else, this entire thing should have opened people's eyes to the fact that the politicians do not give a single solitary fuck about any of the average people. They are only out for whatever will advance their own power and their own influence. And they'll do whatever they have to to protect the people that are close to them and that matter to them. And obviously not a single one of us matter to them. They will do everything they possibly can to keep us held down. But but none of that applies to them. They can do whatever they want. And then and oh gosh, I think I talked about that with uh with Giles when I interviewed him. Like they have no accountability. Like if they get caught doing it, they come out and they give some meaningless apology and then they move on and and the entire media just completely ignores it anyway like the only the only media that covers any of this stuff are the alternative sources of media like the federalist or you know the libertarian media stuff like that uh oan you know the ones that the mainstream make fun of and consider like these fringe alt-right outlets or whatever like the only ones who actually cover any of this stuff in a, any honest fashion are the ones that don't get any attention so like it it's such a it's such a shell game the way that the government and the media handles it and then like you were talking about with the the businesses and everything here we've got this this new round of stimulus that's coming out and it is packed full of bailouts for the big corporations that don't need to be fucking bailed out to begin with. They've been raking it in hand over fist and they're getting more money from the government on top of it. Uh, it's just such a, it's such a farce. I'm, I'm so sick of talking to people and they, with a straight face, tell me that all of these restrictions are in place to help us and to help save lives. It's And it was the same thing with the first stimulus bill. It was like several trillion dollars. We got a measly, us peasants, got a measly $1,200. The majority of the bill went to the big banks and to the, the corporations for their corporate bailouts. So the big banks get all this free money and they get to lend it out to us at interest and make more money off the suffering Americans. Okay, they're sent, so there's, they did that with the first stimulus bill. They're doing it with the second one. A measly $600 to people who are on the verge of going bankrupt. Are you kidding me? While these corporate, these corporate, corporations and big banks get the vast majority of this money and they don't need it. And, and so governors are sending COVID infected patients into nursing homes. Joe Biden uh, taking uh, uh, Lloyd Austin, the who's on the executive board for Raytheon, one of the biggest weapons companies in the country, as his secretary of state. And these fucking morons are going to look him in the eye and tell me that these people care about saving lives. Are you kidding me? Are you going to have the audacity to look at me as if I'm the foolish one? You think these people care about saving lives? There's no evidence whatsoever any of these people give a shit about any of this, any of us. All of the evidence points to the exact opposite. And I'm so tired of people looking at me as if I'm the naive one, because I can see quite clearly that none of these people care about us. Yeah, it's, it, it is definitely. So the fact that like we can sit here and talk about this and we know exactly, like we know all of this stuff. We've seen all of this stuff. We've actually done the research and looked into it. And there are people that if they heard the two of us talking about this would think that we were like these conspiracy theory whack jobs that had like no grounding in reality because they don't want to see what's actually going on. Like they just want to believe that the government loves them and is going to take care of them and that has their best interest in mind. And it, I, oh my God, it's just so infuriating. All this stuff is public knowledge. You can find this stuff if you want. Like, but again, you know, back to the stimulus bills. If the media existed, which is what some people think they exist, which is to inform the American public and to keep a check on power, wouldn't one of these uh, institutions maybe want to report on the fact that the American people are getting raped by the government in, in a, their most desperate time of need? What Doesn't like the New York Times or the Washington Post or ABC or CBS want to cover this? 
I, I mean, but they don't because they don't exist to inform us. They exist as a PR firm for the people in power, which is why they won't tell you that the guy who Joe Biden just hired as his secretary of defense is on the board of a weapons company. They won't tell you that most of the money for these new stimulus packages is going to the big banks and the, the mega corporations as opposed to the people. They won't tell you any of this stuff. They won't tell you about, you know, governors murdering nursing home patients or any of that stuff. Hey, what was it? The... Isn't it Biden's pick for uh, the head of Homeland Security? Like she, she is a huge proponent of putting people in the cages that uh, Biden and Obama built to begin with. Like, oh, she, yeah. <laughs> of course, you know, yeah. But you know, now that Trump's out of office, the hidden cages story is going to completely go away. The yeah. reality of the cages won't go away, but the coverage of it will. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, like when you control the narrative, then you control what the people see, and. This, the really sad thing is most people are just too lazy to go look for anything other than what's being presented to them by the mainstream. They, they, they don't even want to see, they don't even want to find it. Like they don't want to put forth the effort. It just, it requires too much using their brain to get outside of that stream of ignorance that's being spewed nonstop every single day. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's just, it's easier. It's easier to just call people like you and me who do look into this stuff, conspiracy theorists and to call us names. They never have any arguments, of course. Right. Like, you know, even in regards to like this, this virus stuff, whenever I talk, whenever I show them evidence that like these lockdowns, aside from the fact that they cause carnage, uh, collateral carnage, they don't even achieve their stated goal of mitigating virus deaths. Right. Like, you know, Florida ha removed all restrictions back in the end of September, their curve since then has actually been like the best in the country. Their schools are open, their theaters are open. They have uh, people attending sporting events, Disneyland, their theme parks are open. Everything is open in Florida. They have one of the oldest populations in the country and their curve has been the best in the country since they removed all restrictions. California, which has some of the harshest restrictions right now, is currently getting hit the hardest in terms of their hospitalizations of any, Illinois is another state that has harsh restrictions. They're getting, all the states that have the harshest restrictions are currently getting hit the hardest. And that's the case, that's been the case in basically every state in the country since this happened. The, the states with the fewest restrictions have the lowest casualty rates. The states with the most restrictions have the highest casualty rates. And it's, it's true basically in countries around the world as well. Um, Peru has the most harsh lockdowns in the world. Like they have the military uh, enforcing curfews. I, I mean, it, it is the most draconian lockdown of any country in the world. They have the highest death rate in the world right now. There's no evidence these lockdowns work. In fact, have you seen the, uh, so there've been a few different uh, interviews that were done with, oh gosh, I'm trying to find the guy's name now. He was on uh, Free Man Beyond the Wall and, and a couple others. Uh, uh, shoot, I had it. And then I lost, all right. Uh, Knut Waskowski. Uh, so he's an epidemiologist and he's uh, researched all of this stuff with COVID and he's actually working on a uh, therapeutic treatment for COVID that does not involve a vaccine or any of that stuff. Like it's, it's a natural uh, treatment for it using vitamin D and zinc and all that and some other stuff. Uh, but like what he's been saying is that actually these lockdowns did the opposite of help. They they actually allowed the virus to hang around and effectively what we now have instead of being COVID-19 is now COVID-20. Like it's allowed the virus to hang around long enough that it has mutated and it's adapted. And what we have now is not what we had at the beginning. So it, and it's because of the lockdowns that it's, it's allowed it to hang around. Whereas if we had just let it run its course, it would have all been said and done with but instead, we've allowed it to just stay and become a part of everyday life that it now is adapting and changing and, and growing and mutating. And so what we have is not what we had. And, and it's going to continue because they're going to keep locking down, and even though the science very, very clearly says this doesn't fucking work. They're going to keep doing it. And it's just going to keep prolonging the problem and making it worse until I mean, th they're going to stretch it out to use this to enslave us forever. Uh, that, I mean, that, I have no doubt that that's the goal. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how you could come to any other conclusion at this point. Well, you know, because it's funny, the, um, you know, the mainstream media just this morning was talking about how the virus had mutated, right? And I was thinking it's, it's just so crazy. The vaccine just came out. 
now the virus is mutated. And like to all the, you know, pro lockdown freaks out there, I'm curious what they would say. Like if the, you know, politicians came out or like, well, the virus mutated. So the vaccine doesn't work for this. Now we get a lockdown again until we get a new vaccine. Now, I don't know if this is going to happen. I'm just saying hypothetically. So now we get a lockdown again until we can develop a new vaccine. I'm curious, like how many people would just be willing to go along with that? Way too many, way, way, way too many. Yeah. Well, and the thing is the narrative has changed every time that it needed to change. So like you were talking about, like early on, it was uh, to slow the spread and then to get the so the hospitals weren't overwhelmed, but then the hospitals were never really overwhelmed in a lot of places anyway. Yeah, there were, sorry to interrupt, there were individual hospitals that were like really, really uh, in bad shape. Like, right. so I'm, there were a couple hospitals in Queens that were in really bad shape, but in terms of like the the community, like an entire city having its entire healthcare system overrun, that never happened. The media tried to make it seem like it was that. They're still lying about hospitalization rates in the media right now. You know, I remember um, in the summer, like Texas was the big one. They kept talking about how like, oh, the ICU uh, capacity in, in Texas Medical Center is full. It was like nonstop, it, it got so bad to the point where the heads of the four biggest hospitals in Texas actually had to hold a joint press conference to reassure everybody that they had, they were fine, they had plenty of resources and that they didn't understand what the media was talking about. And yeah. they can do it. They just lie about it nonstop because if you remember, and a lot of people don't, the entire purpose of the lockdowns was to make sure the hospitals weren't overwhelmed. And there was never a point where the entire healthcare system of a certain region was about to be overwhelmed. Never happened. And I know the lockdown people would say, well, that's because we locked down. Okay, bullshit. There's no evidence for that. Right. The, the, so there have been since the spring, 122 published papers that uh, studied over 150 countries around the world. And they all concluded that lockdowns do absolutely nothing to mitigate casualties. So, well, and, and like I was saying, like the, the narrative changes every time they need it to. Like as soon as, as soon as it became apparent that the hospitals weren't being overwhelmed, well, then they had to change. It needed to be cases. Well, then when the cases started to go down, oh, then they started to change it again. And then you see spikes in cases at, that just so happened to be at the time when uh, everything was starting to look better. Then you get spikes. Uh, and it, they seem so... You know, it, it makes me feel like I sound like a conspiracy theorist, but the spikes come at just the right times where things are starting to look better. It's like, all right, it's time to start opening back up. Oh, here's a spike. We got to shut it all back down again. Like, yeah. it's it's too it's too convenient and it's too coincidental for it to be really honestly true you know it, like there's there's some things that just when you look at it it's like how it, it works out too perfectly like the nothing works out that perfectly but every time with this covid stuff the way they report it the ups and the downs just happen to hit at just the right times to drive that fear and panic Right. Well, and, you know, in regards to cases, there's also the fact that, like, these these PCR tests are, like, hyper, hypersensitive. So, like, I mean, I've seen, I, even the New York Times had to admit, like, back in August, they were like, you know, these PCR tests can be anywhere from 50 to 90 percent false positives. So you have people freaking out about, you know, surges and in infections when at least half these people don't actually have the virus. And if you're going to use infection rates with, you know, this fraudulent of a test to lock people in their houses... You know what? What are we doing? We're we're never gonna we're never gonna end this, right? Uh, I mean, it's. Hang on, just a second. Yeah, it, there is no end. Like they don't, they don't want there to be an end. If there's an end, then that means they have to relinquish some of the power that they've taken. And there's no, no government well, authority ever wants to relinquish any power once they've taken it. Yeah, let's 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 talk about that because you know it's, you know people. People need to understand once you cede a certain level of power to the government, you're never getting it back. Okay, I don't, I don't care what excuse they use to invoke that power. They can, they can cite like emergency circumstances. You know, just, just look at 9-11, right? Like 9-11 happened. Still, we're still in freaking Iraq. They lied us into Iraq with the weapons of mass destruction. Everyone knows it's an unwinnable war. We're still there. We're wasting trillions of dollars. Our servicemen and women are dying. We're killing innocent civilians. We have... The, the Patriot Act is still, uh, we still have the Patriot Act. We still have the NDAA. We have the NSA. 
people who blow the whistle on the NSA have to become fugitives. All of this stuff. And oh, Osama bin Laden's dead. We got the guy who's responsible for it. And we've still been over there for almost 20 years. And all of these emergency powers that the government implemented using 9-11 and terrorism as, as an excuse, we're, we still have them. And we're never getting those freedoms back. And the amount of, of freedoms that we have ceded in a shockingly swift time um, since this whole COVID-19 stuff started, it's it's really frightening. And, and for people who think that the government is just going to relinquish this power that we've so happily given to them over the course of the last nine months, that's not the way power works. They're going to like they're going to drag this on for as long as they possibly can. I mean, you could argue that a lot of this started uh, 100 years ago with the Depression and a lot of this stuff kind of came. So the Depression was caused by the government interference in the marketplace anyway but then after that Most the government started right people don't know that but with, you know the government interference in the marketplace is what caused the depression to begin with and then then the government got involved to fix the problem but a lot of the power that they took just in that has never gone away like the depression ended but those government interventions did not and it's the same after world war ii and every like every step of the way since then They've just taken a little bit more and a little bit more and a lot of bit more in chunks along the way. And they never relinquish any of that. Like the, the emergency situation that requires or that requires them to take that power and to take that authority, that passes. But the authority and the power does not fall back. Like they, they just keep adding more and more. Uh, it, and people don't, I don't understand how... Oh gosh, I think I posted it the other day. Like you can't, you can't understand history and support the state. Like there's no way you can look at history and say, okay, the state is actually on our side and they have our best interests in mind and they're going to give some of this power back. Like it's just a, it's just an emergency situation because things are so bad right now. Uh, things will always be bad, and if things aren't I'm bad, they'll find a way to make it bad so that they can continue to have more power. How many, how many people did governments needlessly kill in the 20th century alone? These, these are the biggest mass murderers in the history of our species, and yet we're brainwashed into believing that they're all a bunch of noble public servants. They're not. They're psychopaths. They're megalomaniacal psychopaths. They care about nothing except their own power. They're beholden to their corporate lobbyists, not to us. They write laws in place uh, to, to favor their corporate lobbyists and not us. And I'll, you know, I'll even go back further than the Great Depression. The federal income tax. That was supposed to be temporary. It was supposed to be a 3% tax on the wealthy for a temporary period of time. And now middle-class people have a third of their paychecks taken away from them. Right. It just doesn't matter what excuse they give to implement these, these measures and these power grabs. You never get them back once you give them away. Right. It, if anything, it's going, in, it's going to go in the opposite direction. It's funny that you, it's funny that you brought up the, the, uh, the corporate you know, cronyism that goes on with with our government and the big corporations uh, like i had a guy that actually laughed at me because i said that the government was so embedded with the big corporations and and he's he was even willing to concede that there were some situations where that was the truth <laughs> i was like you you're gonna have to prove to me how those situations that you acknowledge are the exception and not the rule because those few situations that you see are just a you know just a thumbprint of the full everything that, that actually is going on you just choose to ignore it like it, it boggles my mind that people can it's actually see the small the small stuff but they don't want to look at the big picture of it yeah it's it's cognitive dissonance and you know it's it's maybe because the truth is too scary this this entity that they're you know, expected to worship and believe and trust and, you know, place their faith in um, that it's actually, you know, it's, it's, I'm, at, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, a, an analogy that, that isn't too, because, because one came to mind, but it, it might be a little too edgy. I so it. it's, <laughs> it's, it's like thinking your rapist is making love to you. Right. Like that's, that's basically what the government, that's how people feel about the government. Right. That, that, they think that the guy who is, you know, just committing the most heinous sexual act of violence against them 
is, you know, is, is making love to them the way, you know, a husband would make love to his wife. And it's, it's, it's not, they're raping you. And that's what the name. That's what who they Munchausen syndrome. Is that what it's called? Munch, uh, Stockholm syndrome. Stockholm. That's the one. I don't know. I got the I don't, Munchausen's wrong. <laughs> I'll have to look that up now. And find out what that actually is. Yeah, Stockholm syndrome, where you, you know, uh, where you basically fall in love with your captor. Right. Exactly. But speak, I, uh, that reminds me. I heard someone say something funny regarding uh, Stockholm because Sweden famously uh, didn't lock down, um, particularly during the spring. And uh, someone said something great. They were like, the, ama "Amazingly, the Swedes are the only ones who don't have Stockholm syndrome." You know, and, and <laughs> being of Sweden, um, because, you know, talk about experts getting their predictions wrong. They said that Sweden, because they weren't locking down, would have 100,000 deaths by the summer. As of right now, they have like 7,000 deaths. And what's really interesting, if you look at their mortality per year, they're actually on pace to have uh, a death per year that's completely, uh, which means they're going to have no excess mortality compared to the past 10 years, which means basically every person who died from COVID was already very sick and the virus basically just took them away a few months earlier. Okay. So you can't look at Sweden and tell me that uh, lockdowns are necessary. It, so, <laughs> and this needs well, to be Well, and the said. crazy thing with that is like, if you look at death rates in the United States, there is not a, there's not a severe, excuse me, there's not a severe excess of deaths in the United States either. Like, in fact, in a lot of, a lot of cases where, you would expect to see like um, so heart disease, cancer, like there are certain things that have been trending upwards for the past like 20 years. And like there's nothing in 2020 that would cause any of those causes of death to decline. Like, you know, the only thing that changed is COVID. So you should see a severe excess amount of deaths because of COVID and those like those uh baseline ones that are always there and that continue to trend relatively steadily up should continue to go on their same trend. Well, heart disease, cancer, some of those other uh, causes of death have actually sharply declined in 2020 because everything's being accounted to as COVID. So like total, right. total mortality rate for the population has not increased significantly. It hasn't increased at all. In fact, so it like, it's just the way they report it is what changed. Right. Well, and I, I, I should preface this. I don't, I don't personally know anyone who, who died from COVID, but I do know people who know people. Right. And I just, you know, I don't like, if any one of those people are watching, I really don't want them to like become offended. Like, like I'm downplaying what happened. Um, but the fact of the matter is these, these COVID death rates, they are hyperinflated because if you test positive for COVID-19, and you die for any reason whatsoever, you get attributed to a COVID death. I have a friend who works in a hospital in New York. He said a 16-year-old kid who um, unfortunately got hit by a truck and wound up dying. But when he was at the hospital, he tested positive for COVID and he went down as a COVID death. And this was happening all across. If you died for any reason, but you tested positive, and keep in mind how fragile PCR tests are, where they're up to 50 to 90% false positives, you go down as a COVID death. And they were testing people post-mortem, like people who died of nothing that even would have been a reason to suspect COVID. They were testing them post-mortem, post and if they tested positive post-mortem, they were attributing it as a COVID death. Like, yeah. And just, the, you know, and just, so why would they do this? Like, what's the purpose of doing this? Other than to conflate the numbers and drive fear. I, yeah, I mean, I don't really know what other conclusion you could come to, because it doesn't sense and you know the the people who um the people who are you know very much pro lockdown the one argument that they always have and it's you know it's a way of trying to get the moral high ground it's how many people need to die you're questioning the lockdowns there's a virus how many people you want to die you you just you care about the economy okay well how about this it is estimated right right now the global covid uh death is somewhere between one and two million i think one and a half and two million somewhere between there it is estimated that around 150 to 200, and 200 million people globally are going to starve to death as a direct result of these lockdowns, okay? So the one argument you have is that you want the lockdowns because you're gonna save lives, you don't even get to use that anymore. The one argument you have, you lose by a factor of 100. So there is no excuse whatsoever at this point 
given everything we know, to continue to support these lockdowns. They don't work, they destroy lives, and they cede an unprecedented amount of power to these lunatics in the government. Yep. And uh, I mean, there's the other the other thing that's been brought up pretty regularly. Um, and I, I really need to I really need to look more into numbers because uh, I'm I'm very much a numbers guy. Like uh, uh, stats stats can uh, they can paint a picture. You can use stats to paint the wrong picture, which the mainstream media has done a lot. But for anybody that actually understands statistics and really knows how to analyze them and look at them the right way, uh, you can get a lot of truth out of statistics. Uh, so I really need to look more into it. But like one of the things that's been brought up pretty regularly is like in third world countries, you should see huge excess mortality rates because of COVID because they don't have the medical treatments that we do in you know first world countries. And yet those mortality rates are not there because it is not that bad. It, like the numbers are being conflated in the places where the governments have a, basically they have a, uh, an incentive to do so. And in right. places in the, like those third world countries where there isn't a governmental power to manipulate and use this uh, tragedy or, you know, this pandemic to, in, to, expand their influence and their reach and their power the numbers aren't there because they shouldn't be they don't exist right well and also i mean i think these like third world countries tend to trend younger in terms of population right so that's another reason so like another stat that most people probably don't know is uh so the average american life expectancy is 79 the average american covid victim is like 81 okay i mean that seems like it's a pretty useful stat but you don't no one talks about it like no one in the media ever talks about this um and, you know, I actually, I actually did, going back to, like, the ineffectiveness of lockdowns, I have to talk about this because I've, I've seen people um, point to Australia as, like, a, a lockdown victory story because, you know, they locked down really hard. They did it right. That just proves that lockdowns work. Okay. So I know a little bit about Australia. So let me enlighten some people. Australia, first of all, they had to lock down twice because the first one didn't work. Okay. Second of all, it's the Australian summer right now. So the virus is naturally going to trend downward. It may come back once they get into their fall and winter season. Okay, but anyway, prior to Australia's second lockdown, they had less than 300 deaths in the entire country of 25 million people. And almost all of those deaths took place in nursing homes. They, in order to combat this, Australia did a hard lockdown in which people were being violently arrested for not wearing masks outside. People be, were being arrested inside their homes for planning social gatherings on social media. And you could not go outside to exercise and you could not go outside to walk your dog or the police would summon you. Okay. And again, this, this lasted for three months and it was all for a virus that killed less than 300 people in the entire country, almost all of which took place inside nursing homes. What sort of maniac do you have to be to look at that and think it was successful? What sort of lunatic looks at that and thinks job well done, Australia? Right. That's in that that is a psycho approach to take. All right. That is 100 percent fascism in every sense of the <laughs> word. Like, there's no other way to look at it except for that. And, and the crazy thing about like not letting people go out of their houses, uh, I think um, I, can't, I don't want to I don't want to give a number because I know it wasn't the right number, but it was a very, very high percentage of the people who died of COVID uh, had a severe vitamin D deficiency. <laughs> we're, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're not letting people go out and get sunlight and be active and right, do the one right. thing that would save them from this thing, killing them. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they actually say that's one of the reasons that like Japan did so well. So like Japan fame, you know, Asia is interesting because like they had, you know, like all the countries in East Asia, they took like very, very different approaches. Like no one knows exactly what China did. I don't know if we'll ever know. Um, <laughs> Korea, which is where my wife is from, they, they actually, they've been pretty strict. My wife has been telling me about like some of the, the standards they've gone through. And it's just, it, it's kind of scary. It almost sounds North Korea more than South Korea, even some of the things. That well, and in South Korea, isn't South Korea pretty strict anyway? Um, I mean, what, I mean in what sense? Well, like I know masks, masks and stuff like that. Uh, well, they, I, know a they, lot of, I know a lot of the like proposed uh, contact tracing and stuff like that that has been proposed around here was already 
at least to some extent uh, commonplace in South Korea? Yes. I mean, they, so first of all, people wear masks. Like I've been to Korea a few times and like the people who just walk around with masks, it's, it's really quite stunning. Like in the middle of the summer, the spring, the fall, like there's a lot of people just walking around with masks in general. Um, so it's, I guess, you know, they sort of have a, a, an affinity for that for some reason. So they're, you know, if there's a virus going around and the government's telling the masks are going to be a magical elixir, then they're going to wear them. But I, I mean, yeah, they, they did the contact tracing. They, they have like these really strict rules in Korea where if, if someone tests positive at like, if someone goes to a hair salon and they test positive, you have to write, every time you go into a public establishment, you have to write down your name. So if someone was in that establishment and they test positive, every other person is contacted by the government who was in the establishment at that time. And they all have to quarantine for two weeks, which, which is just crazy. But then you look at Japan, which like had no lockdown whatsoever. They have one of the oldest populations in the world. And like they, their death rate is like on par with New Zealand. It's like almost non-existent. And one of the things they were saying is like they're, they're elderly are very healthy. They're a very healthy population. And like the, uh, the vitamin D of the, of the Japanese, I don't know what the reason is, but maybe it's some of the food they eat. The vitamin D in this population is like exceptionally high. So that's probably one of the main reasons that um, their casualty rate wasn't very high. But, but Asia is different. So I've also heard like, uh, you know, the tuberculosis vaccine is very, very popular. In East Asia, I've heard it suggested that that may have something to do with pre-existing immunity. Uh, exposure to previous SARS viruses may have something to do with pre-existing immunity. A Asia is very weird. You can't really compare to the Western world to Asia because there's there's just you know genetically, health root wise, just you know geographically, there's just something very different going on there. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, and like you said, like with China, we're we're we are literally never going to know what actually happened in China because they're never going to tell <laughs> no well and fun fact pro lockdown people we actually took this uh blueprint from china this was completely unprecedented there was no literature whatsoever even the world health organization in 2019 for like global pandemics their protocol was um you don't quarantine exposed people like lockdowns were not a thing the reason people locked down is because that's what the totalitarian authoritarian insane communist government of china did for the virus when they had it. And we basically said, oh, that's a good idea. Let's copy their blueprint. Yeah, let's do, let's do what the let, communists let, do. That way we can have more power for ourselves and uh, you know, enslave all of our citizens. Yeah, basically. It was, a, uh, it was an easy transition to just jump right in there. Like We didn't even have to elect Bernie Sanders to, to be the first socialist president. We just needed a, needed a pandemic. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, and you know, like you said, like the, the willful compliance, like just the complete refusal, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how wrong the public health experts have been. It doesn't matter how little interest these politicians have in following their own guidelines. You know, Gavin Newsom closing all indoor and outdoor dining. And then he's seen with the public health experts of California in the most expensive restaurant in the entire state, no mask, no social distancing. None of these people follow their own guidelines. Nancy Pelosi in the hair salon with no mask. When Joe Biden was elected president and all these celebrations broke out across the country, Lori Lightfoot of Chicago, Chuck Schumer, they were all in the midst of these, these celebrations. None of them had masks on. They have no interest whatsoever in following their own guidelines. And it's just crazy because, you know, the amount of people who are more readily willing to blame me for not wearing a mask when I'm outside than these politicians who are literally ruining people's lives. And so, so you want to talk about masks for a little while? Yeah. We, may as, we may as well hit the mask thing. I mean, you know, have you, uh, have you listened to the uh, Alan Stevo interview on peddling fiction yet? Oh, uh, yes, I have. Yeah, it was very good. It was very good. Yeah. I uh, liked him a lot. Yeah. All right. So, so let's hit masks for a while. Okay. First of all, Aside from the fact that the most comprehensive study and the only clinical case study regarding masks, which was the Danish study, the, the most comprehensive study, the only clinical case, case study that was ever performed regarding masks came to the conclusion that they're completely useless. Despite the fact that every study ever done, including the CDC studies prior to 2020 about mass mask wearing by the general population, concluded that they're completely useless, despite the fact that every place that currently has the biggest surge in infection rates have had mask mandates in place for months and have the highest compliance uh, 
of mask wearing in the entire country, despite all this stuff. If, okay, so <laughs> here's the question I have. If masks really are the magic elixir, why isn't Dr. Fauci one of the most hated people in the country? G given that this guy was basically anointed the uh, ultimate authority on all things COVID, and he back in March literally laughed at the idea of people wearing masks, and he encouraged people not to wear masks. If masks are the magic elixir that save lives, why is Dr. Fauci not one of the most hated people in the country? Why is he still adored by the media? Why does he still get to go on late night television and The Daily Show and talk with celebrities and be on the covers of magazines and throw out first pitches in baseball games? All these people who act like I'm personally responsible for every new infection in New York because I don't wear a mask while I'm outside. They want to direct all their ire towards me and none of it towards Dr. Fauci. And that's the mindset that pisses me off. There's no accountability towards these psychopathic rulers who are responsible for all of this. Instead, they will direct it towards their next door neighbor because he saw his family on Thanksgiving. These people would have made perfect Soviet citizens. They would have ratted out their friends to the secret police faster than anyone else in the Soviet Union. And that's one of the, I, I don't think enough people have read uh, 1984 and Animal Farm. And uh, like that was one of the things that always really uh, struck me in 1984 was the children were trained and conditioned to report their own parents. Yeah. Like, yeah. It happened in Nazi Germany and, and communist uh, Russia as well. Probably right. communist. Oh yeah. They, they always, they turn parents against their kids. The state knows how to brainwash people to turn their parents against their kids. You know, and you know, the thing about mass, like, and look, I, whenever I go indoors, I always put my mask on. Like if I go into a private business, like a, a grocery store or a restaurant, I put my mask on. I don't make a big deal out of it. You know, it's a private business. They have the rules in place. You know, I'm not looking to make some 19-year-old employee's job difficult by being a dick about masks. You know, I'm not looking to like brush up against some elderly woman in the grocery store and have her freak out about me not wearing a mask. So whatever. When I'm indoors, I put my mask on. I don't make a big deal out of it. But outside, like... When people say, just wear the mask, it's not that big of a deal. No, it is a big deal because we have gotten to the point where breathing fresh air has become stigmatized. And that is not something that I'm just going to allow to happen. Properly taking in oxygen without a piece of cloth covering in your oxygen holes has become akin to labeling something a murderer. And I'm not allowed to let that happen, especially when there's no evidence whatsoever that suggests mass mask wearing by the public is effective. Okay, and I know that people say, well, if masks don't work, why do all the healthcare professionals wear them? That's different. You're talking about inside a hospital, usually when they're performing surgery, they're indoors. I'm talking about the general public wearing masks in the manner in which we are to protect against a respiratory virus. There is no data, there is no study that suggests this is okay. And again, if they work, and, and you know, there's supposed to be this magic uh, panacea, why are all the places with the highest mass compliance that have had mass mandates in place for months currently seeing the highest surges, right? And I know what the people will say. It's because me and that one other guy they saw not wearing a mask outside are personally responsible for every new infection in the state. That's what these people will honestly say. Yeah, it's, it's my fault because I don't wear my mask when I'm driving around in my truck. But right. It's, it's not the fault of the person who's wearing their mask while they're driving, but then they pull the mask down so that they can take a hit off their cigarette, blow the smoke out the window, and then pull the mask back up. <laughs> or or the, the lady who, uh, so I wore a face shield at, we were, I work at Lowe's, and uh, we're required to wear face masks, uh, or you can wear the shield. So I was wearing a face shield, and uh, so that they could see my lovely face. And I was in sales, uh, but I was wearing the face shield and this lady who had her mask like off of her nose, like it's just covering her mask or her mouth comes up to me and tells me, you know, that face shield doesn't do anything. I'm like, lady, I'm not pretending that it does anything. You're the one that's wearing a mask. It's not over your nose and thinking that you're actually doing something to, you know, make the world a better place here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, um, John mentioned this on the podcast the other day. He's like, okay, think about what we're doing with our mask, okay? Like, we take it off, we put it back on, we put it in our pockets. It's just sitting out collecting germs, collecting viruses, collecting bacteria. Then you put it back on your face. You know, you're so careless with it. Like, has anyone ever considered that maybe, like, mask 
mask wearing in the manner which we are might actually have some de detrimental health consequences. Well, my big problem with it is like I've got facial hair. Yeah. When I have the mask on, I can feel the dampness and the heat on my face. Like fresh air solves a lot of these problems. Like you are creating a Petri dish for everything to just sit there and get in. And, and these masks are not keeping anything out. Like there's, they're, they're not, that's not what they're designed to do. They're not keeping anything out. So you're creating this perfect environment for all of that horrible shit to just grow and thrive. And you're not giving it a chance to go anywhere. Like it's just sitting right there. The only place it's got to go is in your nose and in your mouth when you breathe. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, just think of, there's, there's probably millions of people in this country. And I just realized this who honest to God have probably not taken in a breath of fresh, fresh oxygen in months. Because the only time they're not wearing their mask is when they're in their homes. As soon as they step outside, they put the mask on. They have not breathed in fresh oxygen unrestricted in months, you know, and, and think about what we're doing to our kids. Like there, there were entire generations of babies and toddlers who aside from their immediate family, they've never seen the face of other people. They, they, they don't know what nonverbal communication looks like from strangers. I don't, has anyone ever asked if maybe this is going to have some long-term consequences, especially since we have no idea when these mask mandates are going to end? I mean, we just were told, even once you get the vaccine, you still got to wear your damn mask, right? I, I strongly encourage my kids to take their masks off all the time. Like I, yeah. I'm, I'm that parent. Like I, I strongly encourage my kids not to wear a mask at any point, like to to not observe any of these bullshit rules, like do life. Uh, but I also make my kids listen to uh, part of the problem and peddling fiction and all the libertarian podcasts when we eat breakfast every morning. Like I, I am a uh, full on conditioning them to be anarcho-capitalists. So, so maybe my parenting style is a little bit different, but like, I, I do not want my kids coming up in a world where they don't know what people's faces look like. It's so creepy. And that's like one of the things that like no one's thinking about. And, you know, going back to like, we don't know when this is going to, the, the head of the CDC back like in the middle of the summer, if people would just wear masks for four to six weeks, we would get this virus under control. Okay. That was in July or August. Here we are in December where everyone's still wearing masks. As I, Joe Biden wants to put in a mandatory mask mandate for a hundred days. As I said, that even once you get the vaccine, people are still, there's no end in sight as to when this is gonna happen. You're gonna have kids who were born last year who for the first three years of their life potentially will never see the face of a stranger. And like, like, what was it? It was like, it was like 83 or 90, it, it, was, it was really high. It was in the 80 to 90% range of people who were asked, uh, at, you know, people who were diagnosed with COVID were asked about their masking habits and 80 to 90% said they wear it either most of the time or all of the time. Like, yes. Yeah, the majority of people who were getting infected with COVID were like regular mask wearers. So, so, you know, if we all wear our mask for four to six weeks, it goes away, except that everybody who's getting it is wearing a mask almost all the time anyway. I think. Yeah, yeah, that was, that. yeah. I remember that study. Um, you know, and it's, you know, I live in New York and when I walk around in like Manhattan, I'm literally the only person outside not wearing a mask. Occasionally I'll see one other person the entire, the entire city's messed up, the entire city. So unless your explanation is that I'm personally responsible for every single new infection in the, st in the city, then how do you explain New York experience a surge with all these people wearing masks? If uh, masks just solve everything. Anytime I'm out in public, except for when I'm at work, I'm carrying a gun. So it's kind of discouraged that you uh, um, wear a mask and carry a gun. I can't do that in New York, fellas. <laughs> yeah, you y'all are... Uh, you, see, you need to move to a good red state where you're allowed to open carry. Oh, believe me, I want to. I want to. I was uh, I was looking to move to a couple of years ago because I'm I'm just done with the winter. Most of all, like I can't deal with this anymore, and I wanted to move someplace warm. Um, it's it's still my hope that someday I'll make it out there, but uh, as of now, I'm I'm stuck in New York for at least the time being. I got myself one Philadelphia winter, and that was uh, about all I really cared for. Yeah, but aren't the winters pretty, like, brutal in Indiana as well? Well, I'm in the southern part of the state, so it's not too bad here. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, New York New York winters suck. I, I got I'm totally done with it. I want to move someplace warm, someplace where, you know, guns aren't stigmatized. 
um, especially with this increasing tyrannical government who's, you know, tells you whether or not you can see your family on Thanksgiving, how you can use the bathroom, who you can hug, what you can eat, how you can eat, um, you know, and, and you know, the, the head of the CDC traveled for Thanksgiving, Cuomo traveled for Thanksgiving. Um, and speaking of Cuomo, going back to an earlier part of the conversation, he's being considered for Joe Biden's attorney general. And, and, and the reason Christ. was the brilliant way he handled the coronavirus. Oh, I mean, had, he's, he got a book. He got a book deal. Was that? <laughs> he got a book deal. I mean, have you he, seen he, ha he has the highest death rate of any state in the country. And he's going to be Joe Biden's attorney general because of the brilliant manner in which he handled the coronavirus. Again, sent thousands of COVID positive patients into nursing homes. But yeah, these people care about saving lives. Get the hell out of here. All right. Well, what was it? The. Uh... Was it the mayor of Denver that uh, said that nobody should travel for uh, Thanksgiving while like he he sent that out from like family members house in yeah. Mississippi? Like he had he had traveled out of the state, but he's telling people not to travel for the holidays. Like what yeah, a crock of shit. All of all of the most authoritarian sanctimonious politicians, they they just brazenly disregard the own standards that they set for the peons and no one seems to care. No one asks questions. They are, they always make excuses for them. They won't make an excuse for, you know, they won't engage me honestly about why the lockdowns don't work. Okay, they'll give me a dirty look for not wearing a mask when I'm outside, but they'll just always find a million excuses to make for our rulers who, who just are complete nut jobs and have no interest in following their own guidelines. It's insane. And that's what pissed, that's probably the one thing that pisses me off about all of this. Yeah, it's been, the whole thing has been, uh, it has really showed uh, people's true colors. Yeah, that's, that is for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I'd mentioned it in an episode that I did, I think it was last week. Uh, I actually, I, I removed some friends on, on Facebook because they were basically bragging about, uh, reporting businesses for not wearing masks. Like, these people are just trying to stay open and make a living and you're going to report them to the health department because they're not wearing masks. Like they, they you at everything about you. Like you are the worst kind of person. They are, you know, and um, I got into it with someone. I, I said this a little while ago, but I genuinely mean it. These are the people who'd be writing out Jews in Nazi Germany. They want hundred because they have demonstrated that they will do whatever authority tells them to do. So long as they have been scared enough into doing it. They have demonstrated that that is the impulse and the mindset that they have. So all these people ratting out their neighbors, ratting out businesses for staying open and neighbors for seeing their families on Thanksgiving, they would be the people ratting out Jews in Nazi Germany, 100%. Yeah, this thing has definitely showed people's true colors and uh, it's, uh, it's made the, uh, the lines of friend and enemy pretty, pretty clear. It, it certainly has, yeah, but... Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to see some glimmers of hope. I'm, I'm seeing like uh, the amount of people who comply with uh, lockdown restrictions this time around. It's like twice the number that it was the first lockdown. It's still not nearly as high as it should be. It's like 36% now, right. but it was 18% for the first one. So we're, we're moving in the right direction. Well, and then there are also a lot of uh, courts in different states that are uh, either shooting down some of these uh, executive orders or that are siding with the businesses that are suing the state because of being shut down and, and uh, the unjustness and the unconstitutionality of the shutdowns. So, so there is a lot of, uh, the longer this drags out, there is a lot of hope that's kind of starting to flicker out there of maybe things are starting to move in the right direction and maybe people are starting to, uh, to really come around to what a lot of us have been saying, you know, since April. Yeah, I hope so. And, you know, it's, um, I, sh I should probably get going soon, but uh, we'll, you know, we can move to me on, on talking about this for a little while. So this, this has really gotten politicized in a lot of ways, right? Like it's, it's to the point where like more red leaning people um, are, are like against the lockdowns and more blue leaning people are, um, you know, in favor of the lockdowns, you know, I was saying since mid-March, since before this got politicized, I was questioning the lockdowns. This is not political for me. It has nothing to do with political affiliation for me. This is me understanding that the dangers of ceding this much power to the government, the consequences of what these lockdowns have wreaked, and the complete lack of evidence that these lockdowns even remotely come close 
to achieving their stated goal of mitigating viruses. So it's, it's not a question, and I have to repeat myself because the people I argue with about this, they just don't listen. It's not a matter of whether or not the virus is real. It clearly is. There's two questions you have to ask. Number one, do these lockdowns achieve their stated goal of mitigating casualties? And number two, are the, are the benefits greater than the costs? And the overwhelming evidence to both those questions reveals that the answer is a resounding no. So there's right. no reason there's no reason to do them. Right. And like you said, uh, for me, it's not been a political thing either. The uh, the governor of Indiana is a Republican and he has been every bit as bad as just about every Democratic governor that's been, you know, pro lockdown. Uh, he he has done the exact same shit. It, it is not a political thing. It is a it is a legitimately a scientific look at the facts. And the facts very clearly state none of this shit works. And the only reason they would be doing it if it didn't work is because it, in, it advances their agenda and it gives them power and authority over us that they otherwise couldn't have. Yep, 100%, man. I agree with that 100%. Well, this was fun. I'll let you uh, get on with it. I know it's getting kind of late up there. Yeah, I mean, it's not that late, but I just, I didn't want to make this run on too long. My podcast <laughs> should, should leave people wanting a little bit more. Definitely. And we will do this again anytime you want. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, man, let's do it again sometime. All right. Are you going to, are you going to post this onto the private group? Oh yeah. Okay, cool. All right. I'll check it out. Yep. This will go up in the uh, private group. It'll go on my personal YouTube and Facebook channel or page and also, uh, the podcast my podcast itself so uh, it'll be all over the place and uh i'll be sure to tag you and everything so you can share yeah. it with whoever you want to because hey, i thought i'm well i think this was an excellent conversation and you had a lot of really great content to bring so thank you very much for joining me and everybody listening i will be back next week with another one where i'll probably talk more about the same shit different day evan have uh, a good one take care buddy